Genesis 17, verse 7, and Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 41. If you're there, I invite us to rise in body or in spirit like the people of Israel did so that we can honor the sacredness of God's holy word. I'll read this for us. Genesis 17, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Acts 2 verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer as we ask God to illuminate our hearts. God, may your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. Encourage us. Empower us, challenge us, love on us during this time, during your time, O Lord. In Christ's most holy name we pray and all God's people say, amen. How many of us can reflect on our lives and say, wow, that was a God moment. Wow, that was not by chance, that was not by coincidence, that was a God moment. Clearly God is real. Can I get a witness? Mm -hmm. We've had those moments before. We can't say God is fake because God is real because of those God moments. But you see, it's in those God moments that God blesses us with a reassuring fact over and over again that God is real. That the Spirit of the Lord is alive and well in our hearts. Many times, if things don't go our way, if we're just so darn busy, we often forget that important fact. And sometimes... We need pastors, we need church leaders to say that over and over and over and over again, that the Spirit of God is alive and well and residing in our hearts. God is real. God is alive. God is alive in our church family, even in a world pandemic. We had two baptisms in 2020, one heck of a year, by the way. We had a profession of faith in 2020. God is still working in our church. You see, in the passage we read this morning from the early church in Acts 2, we see the ending of Peter's sermon. And we also see the response to his sermon at, at Pentecost. And if you look carefully between verse 34 through 36, Peter is quoting and explaining the resurrected Jesus, the divine Messiah. Verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, Peter, as he's wrapping up his sermon, it's, it sounds like he's calling the people out, the people gathered. It's, it's like he's saying, guys, you crucified him as a sinner. You crucified him, but clearly you guys made a huge mistake. Look what Jesus did. Look who Jesus is. Because you see, the power in Christ comes from his death and resurrection. So Peter's like, are you out of your mind? Let people know about Christ. You got to talk about Christ. You got to share about Christ. You got to love about Christ. And you can't hold it in. The other day was a very important day. In, in our, not as important as today, but as, it was a pretty important day in our, in our household because it was Amazon Prime Day. And there were a bunch of deals on, like, everything. Like, everything. And for some reason, my wife finds deals about 150 times better than I can. And she found a deal where she, she, she couldn't stop talking. She talked over and over again. Oh, my goodness, we need this. We need this. We need this. We can do this. Oh, my goodness. This, you were not going to get a better deal than this. Can I get a witness? Anybody? <laughs> Something so good, right? Something so out of the ordinary, you're going to want to share it. 
You're going to want to talk about it. If God answers your prayers in a supernatural way, you're going to want to talk about it. You're going to want to share it. You're not going to want to hold it in. But the same thing goes for Christ. Do we share about Christ in our lives? For some reason, when things go well, life is good, we easily walk out of the church thinking that we don't need God. And then when things are horrible and things are bad, then we start walking back in. Where you're not just the CEO of Christmas and Easter only, but you're just, you're walking in because you know, oh, I need God now. Oh, I'm good. Life is good. Oh, I don't need God at this time. So do we share about Christ in our lives? Are our words and actions exemplifying Christ? Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other uh, apostles, brothers, what shall we do? The Spirit was clearly at work in the crowd as they listened to Peter's sermon. The people were deeply moved by Peter's proclamation of the truth. They were cut to the heart. They were reflecting on their role in the death of Christ, which were on the same boat as well. But they weren't sitting well in that space and place. So they responded with, what shall we do? When God is working on someone's heart, they're going to want to come before God. They're not going to want to run away. They're going to want to keep pursuing God to figure out what in the world is going on. Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter was probably stoked that, wow, people want to listen now. Okay, good. They don't want to crucify him. They want to now trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. But here we see Peter use the word repent and be baptized. You see, Jesus doesn't want us to sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. He wants us to make the effort to follow him. He wants us to obey his will and commands. He wants us to trust the process, trust his guidance, exemplify and shine his light. Even though we can say that God does all the saving, at the end of the day, we are called to put our faith into action, such as baptism, such as repentance, such as faith. You see, the word repent doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I'm sorry, and you have a little guilt, trip, and shame. When we see the word repent, it's a complete about face, a change in direction so that we can start running to Christ and stop running away from the Lord. You know, some can say repent is a harsh word, but it's one of the most important, if not the most essential words in the gospel. So many people are afraid to repent because they're thinking, oh, I'm going to feel bad. I don't want to feel bad. There is a a, a premarital counseling book that I I like using, and the title is called When Sinners Say I Do. Right? When Sinners Say I Do. In the first four chapters, it's like ramming into the fact that we are a sinner. (laughs) And 99% of the time, right, it's fascinating. The grooms that I've, I've done premarital counseling for have said, I hate this book. It's like, why? I know I'm a sinner. I don't need to hear it over and over again. I wonder why you need to hear it over and over again. You see, the word repent We're afraid of it because we don't want to hear it over and over again. We don't want to hear that we fall short. But the word repent, it's not just that I'm sorry and we're good. It's a complete about face. Going before the Lord. It's not a harsh word. It's so important and essential to the gospel. We even talked about it the other week, the importance of running away from sin, running away from our idols, running away from laziness, running away from complacency, and coming back to Christ over and over and over again. Even John the Baptist, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter says that here too. 
Repentance is a word filled with great hope where the people are learning to embrace a resurrected Jesus as Messiah compared to how they thought of Jesus before the crucifixion. So after repent, Peter calls the people to baptize. Now, baptism was not common during that time, especially for the Jews. So only those who were Gentiles who wanted to become Jews would go through all of that. But we, should, we, we have to realize that these baptisms show just how strongly that they felt that they needed Jesus. Baptism is not only a sacrament, but it's an expression of belief. It's an opportunity and privilege to completely trust in Him. You can't get any clearer than this. Verse 39 and 40, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, He warned them and He pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So this morning, uh, there are two important reminders. Uh, it's kind of like a little a midpoint summary of the past several weeks, but also thinking about the gospel, thinking about the sacraments. Uh, two important reminders I'd like for us to hold on to as we reflect on the power of the gospel. And the first is this, legacy. Legacy. We talked about this one of the first weeks in our series, and we cannot think about faith just within ourselves. We need to take a step back and see faith in the bigger picture. We need to see how we're talking, how we're walking. We need to see that what we say and what we do might impact not just the next generation, but two generations, three generations, four generations later. We're so hung up about being within ourselves, within our bubble, right, that we're just so focused on what our faith is we need to do a reality check and a self-check and take a step back and go, wow, you know, those words that are coming out of my mouth, the actions that I, I take can affect not just my grandkids, but my great-grandkids and my great-great-grandkids. That's the power of faith. Peter here continues to talk about an active faith. So I want to ask you, church family, is your faith active? Is it alive right now? Is it on right now? Faith isn't meant to be constructed into just a one-size-fits-all generational box. True faith is meant to surpass all human understanding, to go generation to generation to generation. I can imagine back when this church first started, our church first started, the content of the, the words that are coming from the pulpit probably hasn't changed much probably has maybe the stylist is style in the you know because uh, back then the dutch reformed pastors god's word comes to us from and, and it's it's like a sometimes it's like a monotone therefore the word of the lord is maybe the style changed but the content hasn't changed the gospel of jesus christ surpasses all understanding there are so many people that are segregationists when it comes to generations. Oh, we need to, you know, keep the 20-year-olds together, the 40-year-olds together, the senior saints together, and we have to, oh, sorry, we don't use senior saints in our church. We use owls in our church, right? And so we, we need to, but, but you see, the, re, the one reason why we have a 2020 church issue it's because we're forgetting to realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the power of baptism and communion surpasses all generations. That can bring people together. Doesn't matter how young or younger you are. The gospel of Jesus Christ, if it hasn't changed much over the past 50 years, it's not going to change much over the next 50 years. Why? Because God's word is living and active. It doesn't need a Microsoft update, an iOS update. The word of Christ is powerful. It's sharper than a double-edged sword, still to this day. You see, if you think about it that way, Thousands of thousands of years prior, as God was creating the heavens and the earth, as God was having his God moments with Abraham, he promised a covenant like no other. He promised something that will establish God's covenant 
between me and you and the generations to come. The Abrahamic covenant that God's promise thousands and thousands of years ago still rings true this day. Genesis 17 verse 7, we read it. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you. And it doesn't stop there. And after your descendants and after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Thousands of years later, Jesus Christ came onto the earth to live into the call of the proclamation of death and resurrection. They predicted it. They knew it. Thousands of years after that, Jesus Christ is still being proclaimed week in and week out. Not even a world pandemic can stop that. You can say amen. If you look at the creativity and everything that churches across our nation has done ever since we went into lockdown mode and ever since as churches have started to reopen, the creativity is, is mind-boggling. Virtual ministry was actually pretty good. But at the end of the day, whether that way is good, that way is good, doesn't matter because at the end of the day, what matters is that the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed. That's what matters. Church wasn't canceled for 29 weeks. Church was still alive and well. Nothing can stop that. The second reminder is this, impact and growth. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 uh, were added to the number that day. So the church went from 120 people to 3,120 people. I'm not good with math, but that seems like a pretty big jump. It seems like a pretty unexplainable increase. Whoa, what happened? Like, is the pastor good looking or something? Is the pastor speaking really good messages that are just enticing and, or, you know? No, it's the gospel. People heard the gospel. People responded to the gospel. People couldn't stop talking about the gospel. So that means more people heard the gospel and more people responded to the gospel. And you see, baptism doesn't make or break your salvation like we witnessed this morning. Baptism is a sacrament where we can witness the sign and seal of his covenant and his promise where we can say, that's right, I am his. That's the power of baptism. That's the power of the gospel. Yes, every human might, might feel entitled to their own opinions, but every human cannot underestimate the power of God's sovereignty and his omnipotence. God's incredible, intricate, intricate plans for us is unexplainable. God is growing the underground church in so many other countries across the world right now that persecute Christians. Can you explain that? Not really. You, how can you explain that scientifically? You can't. God is growing the church all around the world right now. No statistic can summarize that. God is blessing us with the new revival, and God calls us to live in repentance and hope. God calls us to go forth and disciple those of all nations. But if you're just focused on one or the other, you're missing the point. You see, the intricate work of God's kingdom work is the mosaic that continues to focus on the power of God's words. You see, you cannot submit to baptism unless you know who Christ is. You can't experience the power of the sacraments, the power of God's word, unless you are open to God moments that teach us that the spirit of the Lord is alive and well in our hearts. 2020 has been one heck of a ride so far. Can I get a witness? Amen, church. <laughs> Many of us are tired. Can I get a witness? But we're fatigued. But you see, I'm grateful. I hope we are grateful. Because God is still at work even in our fatigue. God is still at work even when we try to run away. God does not stop working in the power of baptism, in the power of communion, in the power of the gospel. Two baptisms in one year, two uh, uh, professions of faith in one year. Later today, one of our elders, Mel, and I will be visiting Helen, uh, one of our dear uh, senior saints. We're going to be masked up. 
with gloves and everything to administer communion for her. Baptism and communion happening on the same day in our church family. Think about that. God is at work. The work of Christ is not stopping just because we are in a world pandemic. You see, while everything came to a pause in the spring, God continued to push through in his challenges and his encouragements and sometimes even in his tough love. I didn't like tough love when I was growing up. I think many of us still don't like tough love. But at the end of the day, that tough love challenges us and it sharpens us to be a better instrument for the kingdom. As we reflected on this passage from Acts 2, my hope and prayer is that, the, is, is that like those who responded to Peter's sermon, may we first never forget legacy. Never forget legacy and how we can carry ourselves, who we are and what we say and what we do. And second, share Christ. Don't be afraid to share Christ. Don't be ashamed or guilty to say, I am his beloved son, daughter of Christ. Share his love. I know many of you grandparents out there, church family, you share about your grandkids a lot on social media. Can I get a witness? Right? You're not afraid to share about your loved one. It's a good thing. But at the end of the day, with that same attitude, same heart, shouldn't we not be afraid to share about Christ? And blast all of social media, you know, algorithm or not. Just blast it with Christ, 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 Christ. Sharing his compassion, sharing his love, sharing his grace, sharing his mercy. And third is this, live in hope and expectation. The spirit of the Lord is alive and well. And if we take a time machine back into the spring and someone said, oh, you're not going to see, you're not going to see Helen anytime soon. You're not going to see her, you know, this whole year. And I probably would have been like, okay. So I'm excited because we got the phone call with the request. We didn't keep knocking on the door. They called and said, can you come administer communion? And then, like I said, don't worry, we're going to mask up and glove up and everything. But nothing's going to stop communion from happening for Helen. Praise God. Praise God. The Spirit of the Lord is alive and well. I'm so grateful that no matter how much I have to mask up or glove up, I can still administer the sacraments. Even though the, the prepackaged wafers don't, don't taste too good. But if you had talked to me, right, at the beginning of 2020, that I would be blessed and privileged to baptize my daughter, I'll probably never forget this day. If I tell you how important legacy is to my life, how important impact and growth is for our church, clearly God is alive and well. So maybe God will make sure that we never take communion for granted. Maybe God is trying to make sure that we never take baptism for granted. And maybe God is trying to remind us this morning to never take the gospel for granted. May we be like the church in Acts 2 for glory's sake. Let us pray.